I have a bit of a preface um, as we start uh, all of this and just to note there's going to be six different points at which I'm going to stop for any Q&A and you can put your Q, uh, questions or comments or concerns in the chat box and Lisa will uh, facilitate that and ask me the questions when we hit those points so uh, uh, please uh, do that if you'd like. Uh, thank you everyone for the invitation to speak. Uh, this is my um, sixth presentation to your chapter and again I did start my relationship with ISPI which was then NSPI back in the September of 1979 and I went to my very first meeting and I was so excited about doing that and uh, we were coming from Saginaw, Michigan so it was about 95 miles I think up and down I-75 to get to the location and on the car ride back, my boss told me, oh, you're on the newsletter committee. <clears throat> and that's how volunteering works in the society. So uh, regarding this open position, I guess becoming president-elect leading to becoming president, it's something that I would encourage uh, you to consider. Um, there's no professional organization that has given me more in my 41-year career than and this guy and ISPI. Um, so um, thank you for inviting me back. Uh, uh, maybe uh, this is my chance to uh, recover from all the disastrous presentations from before. Just kidding. Uh, seriously, I, heard, I learned a lot in my first three years uh, in the training and development business from NSPI. Uh, and I got to meet some fabulous people both at the chapter level and at the international conference. Um, I, I, so uh, we're going to talk, I'm going to provide a little bit of a background into performance analysis before I get into it, just to set the stage, if you will. Um, I talk about performance, and this is a, a, the description of performance competence that I started using about 10 years ago, I think, 10 or 12 years ago. And performance competence is, as it says, the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements. And the stakeholder requirements are both for tasks and outputs. And I got a lot of this from Gary Rumler, uh, the late Gary Rumler, who you're gonna hear about several times throughout this presentation because he was a key mentor of mine and I learned a lot from him. Um, um, so uh, I learned, again, I learned this method. This was always referred to by the two people that taught me this. They had come from Blue Cross Blue Shield in Detroit and moved to Saginaw, Michigan to work for Wix Lumber, which is no longer in existence. Um, but they had worked with Gary's brother, Rick Rumler, and I understand uh, from earlier that uh, Rick Rumler, the son, the nephew of Rick Rumler, is going to be speaking sometime this fall uh, to you at this chapter. Um, but I was always told that this was a derivative of a derivative of a Rumler analysis methodology, and I was told that back in 1979. I got a chance to meet Gary in 1980 in April at the uh, conference in Dallas. And then in 81, I moved to Chicago and joined Motorola. And I got to work with Gary Rumler on my projects. He was my consultant. And as the joke goes, that means I carried his pencils. And I also got a chance to work with Carol Panza, who's in the audience now too, because she was part of the projects that were, they were doing uh, for us at Motorola. Um, if I happen to mention PACT, this is my ISD methodology set, so it's the branding thing, but it's an ISD methodology set for doing performance-based training and development of any blend. You can call it learning development, but then it wouldn't be PACT anymore, so I'm kind of old school in some ways. And, and then I also have a methodology set for my performance improvement methodologies, which are an extension of my ISD methodologies. Um, and I see ISD as a subset of performance improvement or human performance technology. There's a lot of different labels that we use across ISPI and elsewhere about these methodologies. So um, I just wanted to explain that this. And so what's central to both of these methodology sets is this performance analysis. Um, if you're gonna do performance improvement, you must look at perf the performance requirements 
And if you're going to do performance-based instruction, whether that's job aids that are instructional or training that's instructional, uh, I believe that you really have to have a good handle on what are the performance requirements. Now, this is, I first saw this diagram in 1979 when I entered the business right out of college at Wicks Lumber in Saginaw, Michigan. And I got a change, and I, this is a version that I published in my quarterly newsletter in the late 90s because I had a relationship both with Gary Rumler and Dale Brethauer. Now, Dale Brethauer, uh, both of those guys came out of the University of Michigan. Dale is a professor emeritus of Western Michigan University, and he's been um, very involved in um, ISPI, NSPI, and uh, is a thought leader in that society in the whole movement from programmed instruction into performance-based instruction and into performance improvement. Um, but anyway, so I owe a lot to them and this model here. So this is the, more or less a traditional uh, process model, inputs on the left, process box in the middle, outputs and what's unique about this of course is they've identified the receiving system and so there's five elements as the diagram suggests the receiving system outputs processing system where tasks and steps and all sorts of things happen to produce that output that output becomes an input to the receiving system just like way on the left that input is really an output from someplace else so i like to think of output as input is really key to understanding one of the stakeholders and their requirements, and that's the downstream operations wherever your output becomes an input. And they have a feedback loop here, and I heard, I've heard Gary talk about this before, and within the feedback are consequences. So when I show you my version of this, you'll see where I stole, or excuse me, borrowed all those ideas. Another model that it was very influential to me was this Ishikawa diagram, also known as the fishbone diagram or the cause and effect diagram. And this is the version from 1980 that I saw in 1981 when I uh, joined Motorola, which was very uh, into the quality movement, the budding total quality management movement back in those days. And Dr. Ishikawa was a professor in Japan, and the model was created sometime in the 1950s, but no one can seem to figure out exactly when he did that. But, it's, but it was a diagnostic tool used in quality circles and things like that, efforts like that to improve performance, where you take a look at any process, and if there's a problem, and you're looking at the symptoms of the problem, well, you're gonna look for the root causes. So you would look at the men, materials, methods, and machines, and try to figure out what are the components of each of those and where could this problem occur? And it could, could it occur if there's a problem with the materials and then the machines together? Or is it simply the materials, something about that that's causing our, and so then they'd have to do testing and things like that to see if they could really diagnose what the root cause was. Well, really impactful to me because when I saw this, I said, aha, this is where human performance technology fits because it deals with the men or women or people component of this model. But later on, I began to understand that human performance technology encompasses it all. And it's not just about the human component in processes. It really is, it expands beyond that. If you look at the, the work of uh, the late Gary Rumler, when Motorola created Six Sigma, they bought his intellectual property and they combine the uh, process orientation of Gary Rumler and all sorts of TQM tools and techniques and created Six Sigma. But if you look at what his work was really involved in, it was more akin to lean than to Six Sigma itself and streamlining processes and all those kinds of things. And they did a lot of work like that at Motorola back in the uh, mid eighties. Um, but anyway, so this, this model, the Ishikawa diagram is central and you'll see the fishbone here. This is my version of it. This is a very complicated version, my version. I'll show you a simpler one here in a couple of slides. But so we have, and I've oriented this instead of left to right from top to bottom, from upstream to downstream, where outputs are inputs as they flow downstream through a chain of process steps, if you will. And there's feedback loops and there's consequence loops. And you can see that on the left, the feedback and on the right, 
in the middle, the Red Seas, the consequences that come out. Um, and consequences were something that I really got attuned to because of Gary Rummler and how he talked about the consequence system and how important it was to performance and human performance within processes. Um, so, so that's, so I'm going to show you, uh, walk down a couple of steps to a little bit simpler version of this. But the, so if we're looking at the big process processes box in the center there, the tasks and the steps, if that's our target, we have to understand that context of what's the flow of inputs coming into this. And of course, this is this, as complicated as this diagram is, it's really much more complicated because you could have many inputs coming from many different sources. And this makes it look like it's one simple linear chain. And of course, it's not. So um, if I step down to, it's just a chain of processes. If we're looking at one process in the center there, we can begin to diagnose the issues or the needs of the process. So this is my epi fishbone diagram, and this is adapted from the Ishikawa diagram to try to give credit to it. Uh, when Darlene Van Team, who some of you might know because she's from the from Michigan chapter and was on the international board and president, et cetera, when she first saw this diagram, she said, oh, this is an interesting take on Tom Gilbert's behavior engineering model. And I responded to her and said, no, this is the Ishikawa diagram. I've, I've just uh, morphed that into this. And then I thought about it and I had to go back to her and say, well, perhaps you're right because I understood the behavior engineering model of Tom Gilbert. And so, yeah, I guess maybe that had some influence on this. Although I don't credit him directly as much as the Ishikawa because those people that know the Ishikawa diagram know this is a ripoff of Dr. Ishikawa and that's what Guy has done here. Um, but that's what we do. Anyway, so that to enable a process, one of the things I learned uh, from Rumler and others, uh, uh, W. Edwards Deming also talked about, you know, the problems uh, with performance, quality problems were not due to the individual, they're due to the system, he called it. And to me, that's, that's both the process itself and the environmental assets. But so the first thing I learned from Rumler is to look at the process. You know, is there one? Are people following it? If not, why not? You know, so maybe that's why you're having problems is because you really don't have a process and people are just doing tasks, doing things, producing things, and uh, it's perhaps out of control. Um, the second place to look, according to Rumler, was at the environmental assets, or what I'm calling the environmental assets that enable the process. Before you look at the human, he would always say, well, we're gonna give the human the benefit of the doubt um, but we're gonna look for causes elsewhere other than the human. So the environmental assets that enable a process include, as it says, data and information, you know, static data, dynamic data, whatever. Uh, materials and supplies and tools, equipment and facilities and grounds, you must have maybe it have to be an air conditioned space, temperature and humidity controlled or whatever to the process or not. Maybe it could be outdoors, you know, as, it, as always it depends. But there's also budgeting. Do they have the finances in order to enable the process for uh, operational costs and expenses and headcount? And if the, you know, if the pro demands on the process are greater than your headcount budget, can you use some other discretionary budget to bring in temps to help with the work overflow? So that's always got to be looked at too, because that could be a, a root cause of a process problem. And the last thing there is the culture and consequences. And I think one of my takeaways from Gary Rumler, uh, and perhaps he wouldn't have said it this way, but this was my takeaway, is that a culture is the consequence system. Whatever the, con whatever the consequence system encourages or discourages, rewards or punishes, uh, uh, enables a culture. And, and I don't believe that a, a culture exists across a big enterprise. I think cultures, can exist at the departmental level or a team subset within the department, depending on the, how people are geographically dispersed or not, uh, how they're organized, et cetera. But, but, and so each manager almost can be in charge of the culture as to whether they allow people to slack off, come in late, and they don't do anything about it, and, or they reward good work with more work than anybody else because you do good work, so here's even more for you. So there's a whole bunch of issues uh, wrapped up in that. But so there's the process, there's the environment, and then there's the human enablers. 
And those include awareness, knowledge, and skills, what we in the training biz or learning biz try to address. But there's also physical attributes that the people or person must have. Maybe they have to have stamina and physical strength to load uh, a wagon or uh, have to have great hearing or great eyesight or, or maybe not. Maybe they can do the job if they were um, blind or in a wheelchair. So the, the process demands certain kinds of things from the human, the physical attributes, the psychological attributes. Um, I had a client whose uh, sales group um, where they had, set, they had set, told everybody that you're going to have about 27 rejects, um, failed sales calls before you make a sale. And so people have to be psychologically okay with that, all that rejection before they make a sale. And if that's the average, they could go a lot longer than 27 before they actually made a sale. And are they psychologically strong enough to deal with that? There's many other um, variations of uh, psychological attributes. There's also intellectual attributes. Do we need concrete thinkers? Uh, do we need conceptual thinkers? Do we need people who can think tactically or just strategically or both? Do we have to have, you know, as in baseball, a switch hitter can swing from both sides of the plate. And then there's personal values. Uh, so when we're doing selection of people, we should be looking at all these variables, including the awareness, knowledge, and skills, and try to select recruit and select people who have as much as we need so we can avoid costly training or other issues caused by their attributes and values. Um, and the awareness, knowledge, and skills that we can't hire in, then we're going to have to step up and train or whatever your language is for that, instruct them on that. But anyway, that's the model. And that's how I think about performance. And I can think about performance at the individual level using this model, this template. I can think about it at the process level. I can think about it at the departmental level. I can think about it at the enterprise level. Um, so this is just my application of those two tools, the Ishikawa diagram, and I guess the behavior engineering model of Tom Gilbert from his 1978 book, Human Competence. Um, but anyway, that, so that's where this kind of all comes from. Um, now, now we're going to shift gears here and look at, so when I do performance analysis, there's really two outputs. And uh, these are small, and I'm going to show you full-size versions of these here. But the top one there is a segmentation scheme for performance. It's kind of like a work breakdown structure. So I call these things areas of performance. When I take a job, and this, this one says store manager, so there are seven chunks, if you will, to the store manager jobs. But chunks is kind of an inelegant term, so I don't use that, although I, I do use the word when I describe it, but I don't label it that. Um, so the areas of performance could also be known as uh, key results areas. Uh, major duties is another phrase that has been used to describe this. Uh, Gilbert himself called things like this accomplishments. But what I found over when I first started doing this work in 1982 as a consultant that sometimes those phrases have nuanced meanings that would, people would get hung up in. And so rather than deal with interpreting somebody's understanding of what accomplishments is or is not, I just avoid the whole issue by calling it areas of performance. Um, so that's my chunking device, if you will, to look at the, a job, whether that is a job or a, a set of processes or a team's work that they're assigned. Because I'm going to do detailed analysis, I want to create a segmentation scheme that minimizes or eliminates, eliminates gaps and overlaps. So if I can do that, then I won't be doing double duty if, when I go into the details of analysis. And that's the thing at the chart on the bottom left, which is I call a performance model chart. Uh, this idea was stolen or borrowed from Gary Rummler and Tom Gilbert, and they called their version of this a performance table. And when I first learned how to do this, we used the performance table, which was again, a derivative of a derivative. So they wouldn't have recognized it and gone, hey, that's exactly mine. They would have said, hey, that looks like mine. But, but not exactly. 
but this has uh, morphed a little bit over, over the years. Um, at one point, we called it a job model, like Joe Harless called some of his work. But oftentimes, I was a big deal for them because they were hiring a lot of teenagers who didn't have the work ethic that they all thought they should. Um, and we heard this complaint here. This goes back to the days of Socrates and Plato complaining about the youth. But, uh, but anyway, so it was important that they did progressive discipline correctly so that they could shape the behavior of people and get them to come to work on time, not call in sick when, when they weren't really sick, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is all comes back to me as I talk about this, uh, their animacy about you know, that part of the job. Um, but then there's store operations, you know, opening the store, closing the store, and all the things you have to do in, in between. Then there's customer service and then inventory management and then payroll banking and all the financial management stuff. But this was their model. This is how we segmented the performance. And then uh, we did detailed performance model charts for each one of these areas of performance. And that's what we're gonna look at next for the staffing, recruiting, selection, and training. Now this is one page, I believe out of three pages in the original documentation. We're going to get a look at this one. But we start off on the left with what are the key outputs and what are the measures? And new staff hired and timely and qualified are the measures for the new staff that's hired. So that's what you get from doing the tasks. So beginning with the end in mind, what are the outputs? The second column there from the left, then are the key tasks. And depending on what kind of instructional design I'm going to be doing, am I designing a path or am I designing you know, a course or a job aid? Um, I need, need to be granular or I can be more macro with the tasks. So these are kind of big task statements, lots of details within each one of them. Um, if it was decided that you'd develop training on this, you'd take this data and you'd explode it out into further detail. However, if this is the last thing that they would spend their money on, it's a good thing that you didn't spend all your time and energy going deep on tasks. So this is just to rough it out, if you will. And then in the middle there, there's a set of role and responsibility columns. And you can see down on the bottom left, there's four roles, the district manager, store manager, assistant manager, and clerk. And this is just little check marks to say, well, who's doing that task? So there's two people, the store manager and the assistant manager doing that first task, but then the store manager takes over and they do all the rest of the tasks. This is supposedly ideal performance. And then the next columns we get into typical performance gaps. And we're gonna talk a little bit later how you get those, how do you identify those, what's the secret here to doing that? And there's of course many ways of doing it, and I have my own. Um, but there were two performance gaps here, too few candidates, and, and it was a poor choice in terms of the new staff that was hired. And then the next column is probable gap causes. Now, I, I've had pushback over the years, why don't I go for root gap causes. Why just go with this probable thing? Well, probable is a weasel word. It's because I'm, I want to signal people that we did not do a root cause analysis. We didn't ask why five times. We didn't do deep diagnostics here to figure out what's the root cause. Off the top of the heads of the master performers, in this case district managers, that were assembled to work with me, I facilitated them in a group process to generate this data. And so they identified these typical performance gaps and these were what they believed to be the gap causes, probable gap causes. Um, and a word of warning here, you can bring together the top performers and get them to consensus on something, but it doesn't make them right. Um, but who else would you ask? So in a situation like this where the client didn't have time for me to do a more traditional approach of interviews and observations and document reviews, we assembled a team of people and in two or three days, I don't remember how long this one took, we generated this performance data on all of the areas of performance and then we systematically derived all the enabling knowledge and skills. And this session today is not gonna go into the knowledge and skill analysis component. But it's, it, this performance analysis is central to doing that. But anyway, so, so there's ideal performance on the left and gap analysis on the right. And that final column on the right is where I try to create a categorization scheme for the types of gap causes that there are. And if you're familiar with Gilbert, 
he used DE in a different way than I'm using it. It was deficiency of execution. I'm saying it's a deficiency in the environment, tying back to my adaptation of the Ishikawa diagram. Um, or it's a deficiency K, DK, a deficiency of knowledge and skill of the individual, not their boss, not somebody else, but the target audience. Because if there's a deficiency of knowledge in my boss, it shows up as a deficiency of the environment because I'm getting bad data, input, feedback, directions, or whatever. And then there's a DI, uh, you can see this on the bottom right there, a deficiency of individual attributes and values. So I'm hired to come in and help them deal with the people issues. They're wanting to do instruction, training, learning, whatever you call it. And so I've got to be central to that and look at the human element. But I always want to help my clients figure out if they've got problems and we do this training on this, we might not necessarily uh, resolve that problem if it's rooted in the environment because training is not going to fix that. But on the other hand, what I also want is I want to know what the typical barriers to performance are, what the gaps are, what the causes are. And once we have highlighted that and understand that, then we can work with the master performers to figure out how do they avoid barriers in the first place? And what do they do to recover if barriers were unavoidable in the second place? So there's a utility for this gap analysis data, even if we don't use it to go fix the gap, we can at least give a heads up to the learners, the people that we're training, the people new to the job, that here's the job, here's the outputs, here's the tasks. Oh, and by the way, here's the performance gaps that are typical. Here's how to watch out for them and avoid them in the first place. And if they're unavoidable, here's what you're gonna do. Here's the strategies and tactics of master performers who have figured this out and have minimized these kinds of problems, these barriers from impacting their performance. Anyway, that's the theory, and that's what I've been doing since as a consultant since 1982. All right, so on the left again is ideal performance. What are the outputs and measures? How do you know a good one from a bad one? What are the tasks that are performed per output? If this page held two outputs, there would be two sets of tasks. I do all of my task analysis uh, in conjunction with an output. So back in the early 80s, I used to see lots of people with their task analysis and it seemed like endless lists of tasks and I could never figure out what the heck you would do with any of that. And I would imagine that if you showed that to your client, they would go, uh, yeah, 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 people do these tasks. But if you don't have a view of the output, what Gilbert called the worthy output that meets stakeholder requirements, then when you train people to do tasks, it's to what end? So what I like to tell clients is when you look at something like this, if you can Im well imagine the hands-on practice exercise with feedback that we would give people, because we'd have them in the exercise perform these tasks or in a simulated fashion or a real fashion and produce an output. And that's what we want them to practice on, practice these tasks to produce those outputs. And uh, if there's other people that are involved in those role responsibilities, then we'd have to do, you know, pe have people involved in the practice exercises, the application exercises to do that. And after we've taught you how to do it one time, and that went uh, really easily well, uh, we then throw in the monkey wrenches or whatever you want to call those things. We'd start taking things from the, from the gap analysis and factoring that into the second and third practice exercises to make it more authentic because these are the real world issues and they are not atypical, they are typical. So the new hires uh, learning to do this job should expect that they're going to run into issues like this also, unless of course they just got lucky and their environment, their uh, location where they're working uh, doesn't have these issues. But in any event, that's the intent of gathering this data from an instructional design purpose. If you're gathering this kind of data to do performance improvement, you'd now in a second pass, go look at those typical performance gaps and the gap causes to try to get down to the real root cause. Okay, another example. This is a sales job. This was also comes from the late 80s. So this is real work that I did and I've 
genericize it a little bit. Um, so there are seven areas of performance uh, in this one as well. And now we're gonna go look at another area of performance model chart for this. But every area of performance would get one or more pages of these performance model charts. And again, on the left, key outputs and measures. And when I ask about measures, I say, how can you tell a good one from a bad one? What about quality, quantity, cost, schedule, those kinds of things? And they either say, oh yeah, that's part of how we're measured. But what I've learned over the years is that most measures are informal and often not stated. But master performers have figured out what these things are so that they can always win because master performers just are like that. And so if there's a territory plan, it's got to include all these things and that's what was important here. And they didn't focus on, you know, it had to be done by a certain date or anything like that. They said, that's the key thing. So again, if you can imagine a practice exercise, we would have people create a territory plan that includes all those components. And I won't read them to you. And these are the four major tasks that we would train people to do in order to produce that output in the practice exercise. And of course, there's various knowledge and skills you need to be able to do those tasks. But again, that's not part of the analysis. That's a second part of analysis after you do the performance analysis. In this one here, there were no role and responsibilities designated, at least for this page, uh, because this is the salesperson, the account rep, doing this all on their own. Typical performance gaps was the plan is incomplete. It's not adhered to is the second one. And you can see over there in the probable gap causes, they don't know how, which is a deficiency of knowledge. It, they don't take the time to do this, which is a deficiency of environment, but somebody might have said, oh, that's a deficiency of the individual. They're just lazy slugs, and so that's why they're not taking the time to do this. And somebody else might have said, oh no, they don't have any time. They're so darn busy doing this and all the other parts of the job that they don't take the time because they're just too busy. There's not enough time. So they conceded to designate this a deficiency in the environment, which means we're not gonna be able to train this one away. Or the third cause there is not demanded by management. So this is a requirement of the job, but not really because it's not demanded by management. They'd rather see sales results, you know, sales orders being processed rather than territory plans. So that was the master performers saying, okay, they do territory plans, but they know darn well that it's not even demanded by management. And that's why non-master performers struggle. The plan is incomplete or it's not even developed in the first place. Why? Because management doesn't insist on it. It's the consequence system. Um, but anyway, so that's the second example here. Now I'm gonna do a quick demo. I'm gonna do two demos. This is the first one here. And if I was saying instructional experience designer or learning experience designer or whatever language you use for, for that new job as uh, what we used to call instructional developer or training developer, that's what I was at Wix Lumber in Saginaw back in the day. Um, but so when I'm given this, I'm usually starting with a blank page. I got a flip chart page um, in front of the room. It's a face-to-face -face meeting most of the time, not always. Sometimes these are done virtually. Uh, in today's environment, of course, they would be done virtually because people aren't getting together face-to-face -to, -face to do these kinds of things. But I would assemble the master performers and perhaps other subject matter experts. I learned not to ask for subject matter expert. I learned to ask for master performers because I got burned at Motorola when I was given the corporate subject matter expert on purchasing. And come to find out after my pilot session failed miserably that he helped me with so generously. It failed because he hadn't been out in the field for seven years. He'd been in corporate headquarters for seven years as the corporate SME on purchasing, and he didn't know what was going on in the real world. And our pilot session for our training uh, ran smack dab into reality uh, and the authentic requirements, and um, we, didn't, we didn't have those reflected in our content. But anyway, so, I, so when I do this with a group of people, and I'm starting off, I've got a job title, and my first goal is to chunk out these areas of performance. See, I use the chunk word. Um, and so I, I look at the job title, and I might look at something like this and go, oh, do you guys do designs? And of course, they'd say yes. And so if one of those chunks was instructional design, um, after I've gotten all of them done here, then in the second pass, we're gonna do these 
charts to kind of capture the detail. I'm not going to use any words here. I'm just going to show you the flow of this here to get you into this. So I said, so what is the output from instructional design? If I knew that the instructional development was the next area of performance, I'd say, how do you know that you're done with design and ready for that next area of performance development? And they might say, oh, well, there's a uh, design document. Oh, okay. Now, what I've learned over the years is that people don't think about outputs, they think about their tasks. So sometimes I'm asking for outputs and they can't figure it out. They don't know what the heck I'm looking for. This is usually early in the meeting after we just started. And I, so I asked them, you know, hey, what, give me a task that you do in instructional design with, without it being in those other areas of performance. And they would give me one. But I like to start with the output and set the stage for, we're going to be output focused. We want to train people to do produce outputs. We'll worry about the tasks after we've pinned down all of this. So we stay in this column here, looking at the outputs. And if they said there's only one, I would say, okay, fine. Now, back to the output. How do you know a good one from a bad one? What are the key measures? And they would give them to me. And this is master performers, again, speaking about, this is how we're measured. Yeah, you won't find this written down anywhere, guy. This is, we just know. This is what our bosses expect from us or the clients expect from us or whoever the stakeholder is that sets the measures. And so again, I'm not using the words here, I'm just kind of framing, here's the data, the chunk of data that we would wanna collect here. And after that, I'll ask, okay, so if, if that's it, that's the output, that's how you measure one, those are the key measures, not every little measure that you could think of, but these are the really important ones because we're sorting wheat from chaff, if you will. We're trying to figure out where is our focus. It's on the output and the key measures, not every measure under the sun that somebody can well imagine, but these are the real ones according to the master performers. So then we would shift into tasks. So how do you, do, where do you, how do you start? And I would ask a task and I'd say, so then what do you do next? And they'd give that to me and I'd say, what do you do next? And, what, and then somebody would say, this is why I don't number tasks, I bullet them. Somebody would say, in between task one and two guy, there's actually four more tasks. So I don't know if you wanna call them 1.1, two, three, and four before you go to number two. And I'd have to scratch out the numbers and just bullet these things and write them anywhere I could on the chart and draw arrows in different colors so the people that were doing the word processing of this kind of stuff could clean it up. Sometimes I have a person in the back of the room on their laptop entering this data live as I'm capturing it on flip chart pages. Um, but I've learned that people will go and amend th this kind of data throughout the meeting. So then the next day, when we're working on some other area of performance, they're gonna go, you know, on, on that instructional design area of performance, yeah, we're missing a couple of tasks. So it was bothering me all night, I couldn't sleep. So I gotta get that off my chest here early in the morning and let's go fix that. So we would go fix that. So it's one of those things here that, that um, can be added to, you can recover from something missing by making another pass at it. Anyway, so you get all the tasks, and somebody says, okay, you're done. There aren't any more tasks. You're done. You started, you finished, you got the output. Hopefully it meets those measures. We're done. All right. So then the next thing I want to focus on is who does what? So what are the various roles? I've not identified them here in this chart. So who's doing the first task, second task? Oh, on that fourth task, there's another player in the sandbox of performance. That's good to know. When we train somebody, we're going to say you're going to have to contend with them or they're going to be very helpful. They're bringing this kind of input to your task performance. So this is their job. This is yours. And this is how you collaborate to get something done. Oh, OK, good. Heads up. And the same thing, too, when you get down there and then now there's four different players in that second to last task. And so here again, we're capturing, this is the ideal performance as articulated, as conceded to by a group of master performers who have probably argued with each other, had heated agreements. You know what a heated agreement is, don't you? That's when two people finally say, oh, wait a minute, you mean such and such? And the other person says, of course I do. Oh, never mind, guy, we're fine, we're good. Um, <clears throat> that happens in a group process. But anyway, so what you're looking for is to get a consensus here on the output, the tasks, and who does what. And then you can go for the typical performance gaps. And when you're doing that, you're, you're looking at, so what are these uh, gaps 
the probable causes. There may be more than one. Sometimes there's one, sometimes there's many. And what do we attribute that to? And what I'm trying to do is manipulate or shape the thinking of my master performers that not everything is, is going to be solved by training. And that's sometimes a big aha for them that, oh, yeah, some of the these things. We're going to have to train people how to deal with that real world, and we're not going to be able to make that go away. I mean, it's not that they didn't know that, but they sometimes think that we can, in training, fix everything, um, unless they've been around for a while and they know better. Um, and so you can find all these gaps, in, and uh, excuse me, I wanted to go back here. Um, find the performance gaps, and we leverage those off by looking at the measures, and we're going to look at that after this uh, next Q&A that's on the next slide. So the idea is to fill this in, make sure before you rip the page off the flip chart easel and post it on the wall so we can refer to this throughout the rest of the meeting, make sure that everybody is comfortable with this. And I, I tell the group, oh, I'm doing face polling. I'm looking into each one of your faces to Are going to be perfect um, and you're going to be doing you know analysis when you get into the actual design of your instruction when you do the development you're going to be doing initial analysis if you do the pilot testing and debug it that's a, a form of analysis as well so what you're trying to do is get your instruction whether it's a job aid or a training course um, micro or macro whatever uh, to really help people learn to perform the job of those stakeholder requirements. So if the group has questions, I don't have a chat box up right now because I've got my full screen. Um, Lisa, are there any questions that uh, are coming up that you can share with me? We don't have any content specific questions just yet. There was one question as to how to access this um, deck that you're presenting. And um, just to let everyone know that it was attached yesterday or sent out yesterday on the invitation. But if you still need it, just feel free to send me a note and I can get that to you. But that being set aside, I don't know, you know, I don't see anyone typing anything. Okay. Well, I'll do a pregnant pause here and let anybody do that. And uh, there are an additional five of these slides that have the big Q and percent A so that we can attend to your needs. Um, all right, so the, the tasks that you do in performance analysis, I just showed you that data set. So here's another demo. Um, and the question is, you know, we need to name a chunk of the job. And so this one is on the uh, always airborne airlines. This is the airport sky cap. The joke is always airborne airlines will never let you down. If you've ever been trapped in the air, it's a joke. <clears throat> I can't hear you laughing. So, you know, it's a dad joke and I'm a grandpa now, so it's even worse than that. All right, so the performance. So, what, so if I've got a blank flip chart page or if I'm doing this virtually in the screen, if I ask, so give me one big chunk of the job, one big task set, Something that you do every time in the process that you're doing this, maybe it's on a daily cycle, maybe you're in a project like an Addy project or something like that, but give me a chunk of the job. And a Skycap might say, well, we tag bags and place it on the conveyor. Now I've got something. So I always put the first thing that's said in the center of the page. In fact, whoever is bold enough to say something, I don't give them a quizzical look, I just hear what they say, and I turn and my back to the group, and I write down the first thing said. And it's like placing a stake in the ground. And now I turn to the group and I say, I'm doing face polling, do you all agree that this is part of the job? And they either give me a yes or no, and I tell them about head nodding up and down is yes, sideways is no, and if you go diagonal, that means you're not sure, and it's a joke and uh, try, trying to keep it light. And so if everybody concedes to, yes, that's part of the job, that's, you know, that's something that we would have to train people to do, uh, how to do it correctly, blah, yada, yada. And so then I, then I always ask, so what's the thing you do before tag, tagging bags and placing on the conveyor? And they may think about it for a while and decide, well, 
I guess, you know, we clean up our work area. We're always cleaning up our work area. So we clean up the work area and then a customer comes along and we tag the bag and place it on the conveyor and that's it. And I say, okay, great. So I write that down in front of, and I'm trying to create more or less kind of a linear flow to this, a logical flow to this model here. And I'm never sure. And sometimes it has to be rearranged when I'm done uh, because the group doesn't like it and they see it needing to be done in a different order. But I ask, so what do you do before you clean the work area? And they might say, well, we obtain bags, tags from inventory on our way in from the locker room. We grab the tags and then we go to the area, clean it all up, wait for the customers, tag their bags and put it on the conveyor. I say, well, what do you do before you obtain tags from inventory? And they might decide, well, that's it. That's the start of it. Oh, okay. So then let's shift now and going back to the tag the bags. What do you do after you tag the bag and place it on the conveyor? Well, we provide the other part of the tag and some directions to the customer. Okay. So then what do you do after that? Well, we collect our money, our tip. You know, and then they joke about never, making sure they never had, they can never break a 20. It's a joke. And then we get the rest of them. We try to create this in some order here. And you'll notice that clean the work area shows up twice. Um, and if they knew how to do it and were trained to do it one time, they could do it the second time. But this is just how they might have framed that performance. And we can clean that up later on. We wouldn't want to do two sets of performance model charts on the same area of performance. But that's how we do it. You, you place a stake in the ground, you get one part of the job, and then you go upstream from there until you hit the front end and there is nothing before that. And you go back to where you started and then work downstream from there. That's the theory. That's how I do it. And then you number them when you're done. Everybody says, okay, those are good numbers. And I probably should have skipped number seven there and collapsed it into the second one. Uh, but sometimes groups don't like you doing that kind of thing um, if they start taking ownership of their model. And of course, that's as a facilitator, that's what you want them to do. I want them to own this. I own the questions, they own the answers. These are the answers on the chart. Any, other, any questions now? There still are uh, no questions that have been added to the chat, but I actually have one. Is there a point as you're gathering these tasks where it becomes unwieldy? Let's say they come up with 14 or 15, like is there a cutoff where you say, what's going on with this job? Or do you just work with whatever comes to you? You work with whatever comes to you because if these are master before, performers and they tell you there are no kidding 47 tasks guy and don't get worn out at 17 we got a long way to go to okay. produce that output and then what you'll probably find is that there are interim outputs you know when we do analysis or we do a design we may do uh, some level of design and that's an output and then we do more micro design and that's another output it all depends on how the master performers frame their work but the number of tasks is the number of tasks and the master performers are the best ones, especially if you're dealing with them in a group and they're correcting each other. You know, uh, the research shows us that experts and really every last person um, works mostly on non-conscious knowledge. And when you ask an expert to give me all the details that a novice would need, they're gonna miss up to 70% of the details that a novice needs. And I've got all this information from Dr. Richard E. Clark, uh, who is a professor emeritus at uh, Southern Cal University. Um, and their studies have shown that, you know, experts will miss up to 70%. So, you know, this, this is a huge issue for us because oftentimes we're given one subject matter expert to work with. And, you know, you could, uh, even if they understand that they are out of 70% of it. Now, Richard Clark tells me, Dick Clark tells me that the good news is that different master performers um, know a different 30%. And so if you talk to enough of them, you'll eventually get it. Well, I put them all in the room together and let them argue that out and try to get as full a picture as I possibly can. Um, but yeah, so if there are a lot of tasks, there are just a lot of tasks and you just use up a bunch of flip chart pages or screens uh, shots of the data that you're capturing and it is what it is. Um, okay. There may be ways to organize that a little bit differently after you've captured it, but, but, but that's what they're here for is to give you, you know, what does it take to produce the output. 
Thank you. There's an additional question, which is, can you get away with combining some of the tasks or is there time allotted for this? Well, usually, you know, as a consultant, I've come in and I've, I've sold my client an, an entire project and this portion of the project might take three days, two days or four days or one day, depending on the scope of what I'm analyzing. And I've got to get all of this captured. I just can't, you know, reconvene next week um, because the way I operate. Um, so I'm usually managing my time and I dedicate two thirds of my meeting time to doing this performance analysis and one third to capturing all the enabling knowledge and skills. Um, and so when I go in here, I have to really kind of scope out is should this be a two day meeting or a three day meeting or a four day meeting and then negotiate and argue with the client about that. Um, but so, you, you know, your event, you're pushing to get all the tests and usually once the master performers figure out what guy is asking them to do, you know, they're smart people. They'll be able to give it to me before I and I can't hardly keep up with them because they get it and, you know, and they get a chance to shine and this is them and their work and, you know, somebody has designated them to be a master performer and chosen them to be in this meeting and isn't it wonderful and, you know, it feeds their egos and I kind of feed their egos as well. But so, yeah, you, I, you, combining tasks doesn't do anything because in the real world, people have to do task A, B, C, and D and you can call it A, B, but it's really A and B. Um, so it, it, how you organize it to train people on later on may be different. You may cluster clump these things into groupings for training purposes and see natural breakpoints. Um, and that may be obvious, obvious to you while you're collecting the data and it, and it may be something that you have to look at closer in the design. But anyway, all right, any more? Two any more questions. Questions? There are two more. Please. One of them is, um, do you have the, them do this before the meeting? Do you ever have them do this before the meeting? And then the second question is, is there ever a time when you need to speak with those who are not top performers to collect the data? Um, I never asked them to do this before, um, beforehand, because then people lock in. Well, I called it six areas of performance guy, and I like my model, but Bob over there has got eight areas of performance. I don't know what the heck he's thinking. You know, so I, I always tell my project steering teams that have handpicked these master performers, uh, that's my client and the key stakeholders, don't have anybody do any homework. Don't have them lock into everything like this. The goal is to create a consensus. This group needs to come together, frame the job, detail it out, and concede that, yeah, that's it. That's pretty much it. Now there could be a lot of details left in the task because they're too mid-level or macro level and not micro enough. But yeah, we've framed it. If we teach people how to do that at the detail level, they'll be able to do the job. So, but I don't want people to do work ahead of time because then they lock in and then, you know, they try to take over the meeting and it just becomes a, a, a nightmarish mess for the, I mean, uh, and so, uh, so that I have, Basically, there's four kinds of people I can bring together for this. Master performers who are doing the job to a level of mastery the day before we met. Because I want that currency. I want them to be current and what's the real world like and how are you dealing with it. Um, I also might bring in other subject matter experts. Maybe it's in a re highly regulated area and the regulations are about to change and they're coming out in the next quarter and we better bring in somebody from regulatory affairs to come in here to shape this new curriculum that we're gonna to put together or whatever. And so we may need that voice in addition to master performers doing the job who know the current regulations but don't know what's coming down the pike. We, I also have sometimes uh, supervisors and managers in these meetings um, because they're distrustful. They don't necessarily trust their master performers. I mean, it happens. I've been in these uh, discussions before where, well, we got to send in a couple of these uh, top managers in here to make sure this group doesn't go crazy. Um, and so that's happened. And I may bring in a somewhat novice performer who's recently climbed the learning curve. And I ask the steering team when they're handpicking the people to participate in this exercise with me, I said, if all of these people that you've chosen have been in the job for 15 or 20 years, they have no clue as to what it's like to be a new person climbing the learning curve. So do you have any bright, sharp new people who have recently climbed the learning curve and can represent that better? And they either decide, oh, that's a really good idea, or no, we don't need it. And But I don't bring in non-master performers because I want everybody to 
you know, and people are going to be all over the place. So um, uh, if I bring in one non-master performer, that's, a, that's an N of one. Uh, that's Guy Wallace. He can do part of the job, but the rest of it, he screws up all the time. I'm not sure what we're going to get from him. I really want to know who the master performers are and what they're doing, because I want to train everybody to be like them as best as we can. Uh, of course, it'll take a while after training for them to get out on the job and, and grow and develop even further. But, you know, initially, I want to start them off on the right track. Talking the guy is going to give me maybe bad practices. Guy thinks they're good, but they're really bad practices. If you talk to the other master performers and his boss. So I, I tend not to bring in those other people unless I need that voice of a relatively recent uh, new hire or a person new to the job so that they can talk about what that's like because people with 15, 20 years under their belt, they have no clue. They forget. I mean, they're working on non-conscious knowledge. All right, so um, this performance model here is the goal is to name the output and get the measures, get the tasks, figure out who's doing what, and then we want to look at the performance gaps, typical performance gaps. And the way I derive those with the group is I go back to the very first measure and I ask a question along these lines. Is this first measure ever a problem? Do, do uh, the non-master performers meet this first measure or do they typically miss this measure? And they might say, oh yeah, no, that, that's one that they miss. I mean, they miss that one all the time. And then I can ask, okay, so what do you think the reasons for that are? And they'll tell me, and I'll write it down as verbatim as I can. And then I'll ask them, is that a deficiency of environment, a deficiency of knowledge, or a deficiency in the attributes and values? And I just made up this example here, so those are DEs. So then you do that for, for the, so that's where you get the typical performance gaps. You go right back to the output, because we want to be output focused, and we say, here are these three measures. Is measure one something that, that uh, everybody hits typically, or is there a typical problem in hitting that first measure? And, and according to our chart, yeah, that's a problem. And we might decide that actually all three measures are something that non-master performers struggle with hitting. And maybe it's not each and every time and each and every uh, other non-master performer, but maybe these are the typical problems. And it's my experience that master performers know what the non-master performers are struggling with. And they could fix it if anybody would ask them, and sometimes they don't want to fix it because then they're less of a master performer if everybody's a master performer. And so there's all those kinds of dynamics that you have to worry about. But usually when people are in a room and they're talking about, yeah, no, I know what they're, they're doing and what they're missing and all that stuff, the master performers can't help themselves but tell all of their secrets because they're really not, they're not giving it to me, they're bragging to each other. And so you need to know how to work. I actually tell them, yes, yeah, what you're doing, you're bragging to each other, aha. So you'll give it up, you'll give me all your secrets because you want to let everybody else in the room know, this is, these are your tips and tricks. Uh, because you want to feel good in, in, with your peer group, the other master performers. Anyway, so that's how we get to the typical performance gaps is we derive them off of the measures. And again, the measures were established by asking about the output, a design document or analysis report. How can you tell a good one from a bad one? And I start there and I write down what they tell me and then I say, okay, are, are those quality measures and quantity measures and time measures and cost measures? You know, and then we talk, can talk about those things too. And they might say, yeah, there's a time measure, but you know, if you're not done by Friday at five o'clock, it's no big deal. It's really Monday at 8 a.m. Um, so again, we're relying on the master performers to give us guidance in terms of what are the authentic performance requirements for outputs and tasks and what are the stakeholder measures for those things. And I don't do measures on tasks. I simply do it off the output. Um, because of a time limitation. Later on, if we're designing training um, and developing content, then you might ask the question about what are the measures for task one versus task two versus task three, et cetera, and get those reflected too. But again, I'm usually working under a time constraint and we're in a hurry. And part of my uh, value proposition promise is that I'm gonna make this happen quickly. Instead of taking three weeks or three months to do analysis, we're gonna do it three days, studying an entire job. 
Um, next round for questions. We don't have any in the box right now. Okay, let's move on then. So this is a time for your hands-on application exercise. And what I'd like you to do is to each of you to spend four minutes dealing with this and, and coming up with the areas of performance or the chunks of the job or however you would like to talk about it for a job that you yourself had when you were a kid or a summer job when you were in high school or college. Um, and if you don't have any of those, then what your very first job is, but something that's familiar to you. And, and just, you're trying to clump together task sets and give it a name. If you're a babysitter, you know, there's a different set of areas of performance. One of them might be, you know, putting the kids to bed. And what did you do before that? What did you do before that? What did you do before that? And what did you do after the put them to bed? Well, I went and did the dishes or whatever the, the job is you saw it. So I'd like you to take four minutes. I'm gonna start my timer and have you do that. And then we'll do a debriefing and answer any of your questions about this. Uh, and Lisa, if they will type in some of their areas of performance, the job, the job that they had and a couple of the areas of performance so we can talk about whether they're performance oriented or topic oriented. Don't write down topics, write down things that are more task uh, oriented. Two minute warning. Okay. All right, so we have one, one of our uh, participants was a fast food worker, okay. and the tasks were prep food, wipe tables down, turn on machines, take orders at the register, cash customers out, give orders to cook, and give customers food. Excellent. All right, so 
Um, some of those might have been able to be put clustered together, but but as I, you know, um, I didn't write them down as you were reading them to me, but but those sound like good chunks of the job, and you could string those into a logical order, and I think that that's a good example of that. Um, anybody else? Yes, we have a couple more. So, uh oh. Scrolling too fast, can't read that fast. All right, so the next person shared that they served customers at a restaurant and their steps were um, greet customers entering the restaurant, provide customers with menu and glass of water, take customers orders for drink and food, submit food orders to the kitchen, fulfill drink orders, take drink orders to the customers, serve food to customers when ready, check in with customers to see if they need additional food or drinks and take customers money in payment for the food. Excellent. So those are, so in the two examples we have, those are kind of micro tasks. So it's almost as if you didn't need the framing of areas of performance, but there are details, nuances in each one of those statements. So so areas of performance are nothing but then macro task statements if you think about it like that and there's no right answer you could have taken that last one and I forget how many what what the number of uh, areas of performance were but if a couple of those were merged as long as it captures the totality of the job that's what you're looking for so whether you know you would have analyzed it differently than me and I would have put two of your areas of performance together as one it's not a big deal because when we get down to what the outputs are, what the tasks are, it's like the areas of performance are a means to the ends of getting to the details and making sure that you didn't have a big gaping hole in your data set. Because if you're like me, an analyst, you don't know anything about the job. They could have, I tell groups, you could have gotten together at breakfast and decided you're just going to take me on a wild ride and lie to me, and I wouldn't know any different. But your name is going to go on the report, so they're going to hold you accountable and not me. And they all laugh at that. All right, so is there uh, any more examples here? There are actually three more. All right. The next one is store clerk hardware at the hardware store. Mm -hmm. um, and we have uh, customer service, repair window screens, bikes, and heaters, store upkeep, which included cleaning, opening, and closing, mm -hmm. department maintenance, stocking, training, and the last one is using software. All right, so I would have said that using software, I would be more explicit in terms of using the software for what tasks. And it might have been financial or inventory management or something like that. And the first one, customer service, that's nebulous. That's more of a to topic if you would have said, um, if, if you could have turned that, if I was dealing with a group and they gave that to me, I would say, well, tell me more about that you can't tell somebody wrong you know you've got to say you got I always write it down and then ask the group if that's good and then if I don't like it I have to find some way of massaging that into what do we mean by customer service is this you know answering customers questions about products well that's a kind of customer service or is it handling complaints which is a different kind of service so I would want to be a little bit more explicit in that and if I'm writing this down in a flip chart, I would have circled customer service and drawn a couple of lines off of it and wrote some of the examples of that and looking for some way to turn that less into a topic area than a task area. Now, the group could have said, no, guy, that's a task. No kidding. You know, we all understand it just because you don't. And so then I have to concede to them and go with that. But I'm, I'm really help wanting them to be able to articulate the outputs and not something that's kind of broad as customer service usually is. But anyway, so uh, the other examples? Okay, next, bank clerk. Um, with sort checks, file checks, prepare statements, and mail statements. Okay, excellent. All right, and excellent. then our final one that was submitted is a, block, a representative at Blockbuster Video. Um, and so I'm just going to read what's here. Initially thought of the task of organizing the new movies in the drawer before they released, but realized it's more involved, it, it, I'm sorry, but realized it involved many smaller tasks. 
First is verify movies coming in matched our invoice. Then prep movies with Blockbuster branding. Create communication for team about which movies were coming out and when. And add new movies into the inventory in the computer system. See, that I think that those were good. Ta yeah, there's a lot of tasks, nuances, detailed tasks underneath those area of what you what you would do. But I think that as headers, and then the acid test question that I always ask once I get all the areas of performance on the flip chart is there my acid test question. And I tell them this is the acid test question: Is there anything that you have done in this job over the last two years that doesn't fit inside one of these boxes? Mm. And then they have to think about that. And I, you know, go get a cup of coffee or whatever and sit there and just let them think about that. And by now it's a game, it's a competition. I've gamified this whole thing. And they want to make sure that they can identify every last big chunk. And they might volunteer somebody and something will say, no, that's under that second area of performance. They go, oh yeah, okay. So there's all, right. all these details underneath us that we haven't gotten to yet because we're gonna move next into the second part of your exercise then. Is so I'm gonna ask you, uh, there's one additional clarifying question and you right. may be headed here with us. How do you determine an area of performance versus tasks when you're facilitating the meeting? I'm asking for bigger areas. So if I was, you know, if I was talking to instructional designers, analysis has got lots of tasks, lots of different kinds of outputs. That's a big chunk. Design, that's another big chunk. Development, that's another big chunk. So I'm looking to find their equivalency in their work. And it does take a lot of dialogue. Um, it, that, you know, the group is trying to figure out what the heck does guy want? I can give him all these micro tasks, but that's not what he seems to be asking for. He's asking for the bigger, uh, uh, task sets and to give it a name. And if they in their real world performance don't think like that, they just do this, do that, do this, do that, do this, do that, do that. they don't hardly know. So it's like if you're talking to a salesperson, do you do a sales call? Yes. Well, what do you do before the sales call? Well, we prepare for the sales call. Okay, what do you do before that? See, but in preparing for the sales call, you know there's a whole lot of details. And when you're conducting a sales call, there's a whole lot of details. So once they figure out what level I'm trying to operate at, because what I'm really trying to do is frame the detailed analysis. And if I allow the group to go deep on the very first thing, analysis, oh, guy, let me tell you, 47 tasks, do this, do that. And all of a sudden, they are too tired, mentally exhausted to think about design and development, implementation, evaluation. So they go, oh, yeah, there's that other stuff, but it's not important groups are like that. So I, I want to make sure that I frame this correctly and it's going to sound very task oriented. And I had a client at Amico who, who they had, they broke into an argument. I trained a whole bunch of people at Amico back in the nineties uh, and uh, they called me up and they said, we have this big debate here. We have a temp that comes in and they copy VHS tapes. And so the analyst says that there's only one area of performance and guy that cannot be right. Copying tapes and that's all they do. I go, what else do they do besides copying tapes? And they say, well, nothing. I go, well, there's only one area of performance. Now detail out all the co what copying tapes is, task by task by task by task. And when you're done, you have a copied tape. Boom. But uh, so there is no perfect answer on that. And sometimes it's a struggle to get a group to uh, think about, you know, things at a higher level, you know, they're used to, you know, their tasks are detailed and they love to talk about the details of their tasks, but here's guy trying to keep it at some high level and that's a struggle for them. But I need to do that to make sure that we've got it covered end to end. And if only we go in and detail it all now, then we'll have the whole darn thing. But if I don't do that, I, I've lost control of the meeting and then I'm not sure that really I've framed the whole thing and gotten the details on the whole thing. I may have a lot of details when I'm done, but I may be missing a big chunk of the job because of how I process the group. All right, we're getting Thank close. To, we're not gonna be, this is, a, this is the next exercise. Take one of your areas of performance and identify the output. And an output is usually physical, kickable, seeable, uh, if it's a decision, you can write it down and your decision is now physical. So think about for one of your areas of performance in your job, what the terminal output is, one of them in an area of performance, because there could be more than one. 
and what some of the key measures are, and then just a few tasks. And don't try to do a whole, all the tasks. I'm giving you four minutes to do this. And then pick from the output and the key measures one of the typical performance gaps that you know you struggled with or your peers in that job struggled with. Go. One more minute. Okay, let's wrap up. So rather than you typing in, you know, your data as that would be, did you find this easy or difficult or what was tricky about it or what ahas did you have? We don't have anything in the box just yet. I would imagine people may be typing, but what I'll share is that I didn't think it would be as easy to, um, to do this as it was, and um, I didn't think it would be, it would move as quickly as it did. So that was helpful. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, so you're not contending with trying to take people who articulate the same thing using different language and trying to figure out is that the same thing or not? And sometimes they're not sure whether or not they're talking about the same thing. It's uh, semantics is always an issue when you're doing this kind of thing. Good point. Thank you. Um, so we have a question. Uh, how to handle how do you handle situations where some of the key tasks can't be measured, for instance, coding a new heart or new software. Um, so again, it's the output. So I wouldn't measure the task. I would measure the output. So if it's coded software is the output, you know, so that there there may be various standards depending on what that is, but time may be a measure but it varies depending on how big the assignment was or whether it's routine, you know, if you're making the same widget over and over again, or if this is a unique custom thing here, but time is a measure and we just don't maybe have good standards. What I found is that people can tell you how they would measure something, but they can't tell you what the standard is. They can't say, oh, it's, you know, got a weigh between 1.1 pounds and 1.3 pounds, somewhere in there, that's the tolerance it's weight and about one pound or something like that is as close as they can get. But that, but that is difficult. But master performers know how they are measured and they know what the standards are and they're usually informal and they could vary from boss to boss to boss. And that's what you uncover is that there are no standards, but it, time is a measure or quality is a measure, but people measure quality a little bit differently. And that's what you uncover. And so if the, one of the things about, you know, uh, to affect performance, you've got to be clear with your expectations. Well, our expectations are muddled. Aha, uh -huh. that may need to be cleaned up, or we may, may need to teach people how to go and pin down your bosses to what the heck the measures are for this assignment, you know, <laughs> because that's, that's sometimes what it takes. Anything else? No, that's it. Okay. Let me rattle through the rest of this here. So I like to use a facilitated group process with a team of master performers, other subject matter experts, sometimes managers, supervisors, sometimes novice performers, and facilitate them to capturing this data. And when they concede to it, or if there's outliers, people who say, well, I don't agree with that, then I capture their disagreements as well. So I've got all the voices captured. A more traditional approach, which takes longer, um, and uh, is a traditional set of SME interviews or master performer interviews, observations and document reviews. But I never felt comfortable doing that because I was never sure, what am I observing actually? Because I can see the physical behaviors but not the cognitive behaviors. I can ask questions about that, but, and, but they were operating on non-conscious knowledge so they can't tell me either. But when I'm dealing with a facilitated group of master performers, it's magical how they can add to each other, uh, you know, say, oh, Bob, you've got that wrong here. Aren't, don't you mean such and such? And aren't there three of them instead of two of them? Bob might go, oh, yeah. So uh, I have more confidence in the data that's produced with the group uh, uh, process than with the traditional approach. Um, there's no time for this exercise, but after we're done, you should do this on another job that you've had and or 
something you've addressed with training and development where you feel like, hmm, let me take a look at something I did last year or the year before and frame it in areas of performance and then do the performance model charts. There's two uh, charts in the back of the slide deck that's your handout uh, when you get that and you can make copies of those and play around with this or create your own format or whatever. I was uh, lucky to write chapter 11 in the, hand, the third edition of the Handbook of Human Performance Technology, chapter 11 on modeling mastery performance and systematically deriving the neighbor, enablers for performance improvement, which is all those enablers, those human enablers and those environmental enablers that were part of my fishbone diagram. That's covered in this 25 page PDF and it's free, it's on my website and go get that if you want. I uh, wrote an article, uh, co-authored an article in November of 1984. You've heard of that year, I'm sure some of you. It was before your time. But uh, me and my business partners wrote this on how to use a group process to create models and matrices, and you just created a couple of them yourself here as a starter. And then uh, the two months before that article came out was how to use a group process to build a curriculum architecture design. This was in Trading Magazine. Again, 1984, a long time ago. This has been used a lot. Uh, uh, we'll see if you have any final Q&A, but I want to get to this. There's a, my book, Lean ISD. This is the book that they're going to give out as a handout. It's also available as a free 410-page PDF on my website. You'll find it under the Resource tab under Free Books. These books on the right are books that I wrote in 2011 where I took all five of my other books and updated them all and created a six pack. So I got to joke with Bob Mager that I have a six pack too. And he laughed and said, good luck with that. Bob Mager, as you may know, passed away uh, just last month anyway. So I, we'll all miss him. So performance competence, the ability to perform tasks, to produce outputs, to stakeholder requirements. I could have called this performance capabilities, but I stole the word competence right from Tom Gilbert's book, Human Competence, because in honor of the people that have taught me well. So thank you for your time today. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, you know, email me. I'll be uh, happy to uh, deal with that. If you want to set up a Zoom meeting and talk about it, we can do that too. That's my email address. Thank you, and I'll turn this back over now to, uh, I guess, Teresa.